exploring the intellectual dark web as an alternative to campus groupthink, next on Campus Roundup. Hi, I'm Dr. Duke, and this is the Campus Roundup at the College Fix. Our top story segment this week focuses on the intellectual dark web. To talk more about this, we welcome Max Diamond, a former journalist at the College Fix and currently a reporter at the Raleigh News and Observer. Max, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you so much for having me. Well, what a fascinating concept. Describe for our listeners what you defi- how you define the intellectual dark web. Sure. So... The term originates, first of all, with Eric Weinstein, who is a mathematician and is currently the manager of Teal Capital, Peter Teal Capital. And uh, the intellectual dark web is basically an assortment of thinkers uh, who use YouTube and other uh, social media uh, platforms to promote uh, heterodox ideas. Uh, they, they're they most specifically uh, heterodox in reference to uh, uh, left-wing positions. So they're, they're thinkers who often criticize orthodox left-wing positions using uh, YouTube and other uh, online mediums. My goodness, you just described what I do half of my time. <laughs> <laughs> people like Stefan Molyneux, people like who are, uh, Jordan Peterson. Name some of the, the, the yeah. intellectual dark web people who you found most uh, persuasive in opening your mind. Well, I, Jordan Peterson, Professor Jordan B. Peterson at the University of Toronto is a major one. I think he, he, he is perhaps the most famous, although there's a whole there's a wide range and there's a wide and, and they range, uh, you know, widely in terms of their political positions. They're not just, you know, right wing or even even necessarily center right positions. For example, uh, Brett Weinstein, who uh, was a professor at Evergreen uh, College in Oregon. Is uh, is known as a, a quite a left wing person. Uh, he's known to have supported Bernie Sanders, for example. Uh, but he found himself, you know, challenged by students at his college when he uh, criticized a day uh, at that college where the white students uh, were supposed to actually leave the campus. And because he pro- he, he uh, expressed opposition to that day, uh, he was protested against. Now, I want to push that angle with you. You went to Reed College, who we've just done stories on here. Reed has been uh, uh, focused on College Fix as well because of uh, ideological issues they've been having. And so at Reed College, you make the argument that, you know, you had, while you had some good professors at Reed, you really didn't have anybody that allowed you to think outside the box. And the more you listened to the same liberal narrative again and again and again, the more you recognized you had to go somewhere else to find that kind of engagement. Talk about your time at Reed. Yeah, sure. So I would say that the orthodoxy, the political orthodoxy, at least, was uh, most found among the students. Uh, you know, a lot, a lot of professors don't really get into uh, politics, you know, especially if they're not political science professors. They don't really want to get into politics, especially not the sort of nitty gritty of policy and a contemporary politics. But this, there's, a, there's definitely a strong political orthodoxy among the students at Reed. I would say that just from talking to uh, people I know, uh, and you know, and trying to read stories like on the College Fix and other websites about college campuses, it doesn't seem like my experience at a liberal arts school, at least, is unique. Um, but but I would say the orthodoxy is found primarily among the students, um, and and those are the people who are really uh, enforcing in in a variety of ways, sometimes through uh, aggressive protests. Um, orthodoxy. That's really a fascinating observation. We know that campuses are liberal places, and even those professors who don't want to talk politics almost extro- almost in every instance lean slightly or very much to the left. To the left. You mentioned uh, biology professor Weinstein. He's a classic example. Pretty radical, uh, pretty leftist in his thinking, yet he w- was willing to stand up against uh, the kind of censorship that left-wingers want to pr- promote on campus. Right. So you say the orthodoxy is primarily among the kids. Where do you think they get it from? It's a good question. So uh, to be clear, there is a, a factual basis for saying that there is political orthodoxy uh, in terms of the persuasion of the professors and administrators. So, for example, if you look at uh, Professor Jonathan Haidt's Heterodox Academy, that's an organization uh, devoted to promoting intellectual diversity in the university, you can go on their website and you can see that since the late 1980s, uh, college faculty and administrators have increasingly leaned left. So, for example, in the early 90s, about 40% of uh, uh, people who worked in universities identified as far left or liberal. 
Now it's 60 percent and moderates have gone a lot, very far down and conservatives have gone down. So there is, there is evidence that people who work in universities are more liberal. It's just a question of are they the ones who are necessarily enforcing an intellectual orthodoxy among the students? And I don't think that's I, I don't have as much reason to think that's accurate than to say that it's uh, the students. Now, why is that? I mean, you know, to some extent, that might always be the case. You know, there's psychological reason to think that maybe young people just tend to be more liberal. Why is it so extreme right now? Uh, that's a difficult question. Um, I think that I, I, I can't give you the fundamental reasons, but I can say that right now it has become increasingly acceptable for many students to uh, use tactics that we would regard as anathema to a university in order to shut down ideas they don't like. And that just become, for many students at least, that's become acceptable. Uh, why that is, it's tough to say. Now talk about the dark web a little bit further. What would you encourage students and uh, even adults who want to get a different view, want to be able to sort of uh, dance around uh, heterodox orth uh, ideas, ideas that are no longer considered acceptable, primarily conservative ideas, but not exclusively. How would you urge them to get involved in the dark web, the intellectual dark web? And are there any warnings you would have for them as right. they enter into that world? Right, right. So, you know, one of the benefits of a university is that you have a lot of people around. So, you know, if, if you, this can backfire, but one of the benefits of having a lot of people around is that you can be con in constantly in conversation with people. So maybe you develop an idea or you hear about an idea and maybe it's not that good. On the internet, the benefit is that you have way more exposure. So what you should do if you want to get exposed to these ideas is you should, I would begin with looking at people like Jordan B. Peterson or Jonathan Haidt or Brett Weinstein. I would, I would look not just for thinkers who are different than thinkers you're likely to encounter in the university, but a wide range of those thinkers. And I think that those three, but many others, you know, Ben Shapiro, for example, there's, there's many others uh, who you could look at who are very smart people who, who are doing a lot on the internet. Um, but I would advise people to not, not stop talking to, you know, their peers, even if, even if their peers are very far left, they're very far right, or very dogmatic, because it, you, you, you shouldn't just rely upon, you know, these thinkers on the Internet. You still need to be able to communicate your ideas and, and learn why other people don't like them at the very least. To read more stories like this, follow The College Fix on Twitter and Facebook. Max Diamond, thank you so much for your time today. Very illuminating. Time now for Talking Campus, our weekly discussion with members of the College Fix editorial team. Today I'm joined by College Fix assistant editor Daniel Payne for a continuing conversation about the intellectual dark web. Daniel, thanks for joining us today. Duke, always good to be here. Thanks. We'll talk about this. We had a really interesting, illuminating interview about this, but the, the intellectual dark web, the idea that kids are going to go to the internet to find real free thinking that they don't get on a college campus. What are your thoughts about this? Well, I, I feel uh, very strongly about it because I, I experienced the same thing in my own college days, um, you know, because because, you know, I, I went to a college with some good teachers, studied some good stuff. Uh, there's no doubt about that. But it was very ideal, ideal, ideologically monolithic. Um, so you really do kind of have to go somewhere else to to search and find uh, dissenting voices. And what I ended up finding, of course, was was the internet, uh, and and there's plenty out there to read. You know, I started reading, um, you know, all the big magazines, uh, National Review, the Weekly Standard. Uh, I read Voices at the Wall Street Journal. They had a lot of good columnists. I read City Journal. Uh, Heather McDonald was great over there. I started reading Christina Hoff Summers. So it, it's really unsurprising that more and more students are turning to the internet to get the sort of diverse and and interesting uh, experience of of reading that they're not getting at their colleges. Yeah, I, we were just talking before the show. I teach at the university. I was teaching a class this morning, and I am providing my kids some of those heterodox ideas. I'm challenging their monolithically liberal assumptions, and the kids are honest. Some of them get angry. Others of them just are kind of mind-blown because they'll say to me, Dr. Pesta, I don't know if I agree with you or not. I, I just never heard this before. And unless we're giving kids or finding a way to provide students with what the other side has to say, they have no ability to gauge what it is they think they believe. 
Yeah, I mean, it's kind of like somebody coming out from behind the Iron Curtain and, and being handed a, a, a fresh can of Coca-Cola and just saying, <laughs> I've, I've never experienced anything like this before. And yeah, in, in some cases, uh, they can, uh, you know, students will get mad and defensive and shut down. But, you know, a lot of these kids, they're, they're not bad kids. They're not stupid kids. They, they've just kind of grown up in a bubble. And when they are exposed to new and challenging ideas, a lot of them might stay liberal. A lot of them might not change at all. But you do find a willingness in, in, in uh, more than a few cases to to kind of uh, engage with the material. Now y- you do see, of course, a lot of the uh, you know protest movements and when you know they shut down uh, speakers that come to campus. There's a lot of that going on and it's very troubling. But there are you know a decent number of students who who are just interested in in learning more than they've been exposed to, and and it can be encouraging when you find that. Yeah, I agree. Our kids are not in many senses by any means ignorant. They're just in cases miseducated or miseducated in a educated only in a bubble. You you mentioned this Christina Hoff Summers, who I really love too. She's a classic example of of somebody who I think is an intellectual dark web superstar. She has she's a woman, she by her own accounts has many feminist issues. She's by no means a right winger, and yet she has the guts to 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 question and challenge the out of control academic feminist arguments that really in many senses has come across as just simply anti-male. Yeah, Hoff Summers is, is an excellent example. And in particular, like you said, she's not a right winger. Uh, she, can, she considers herself, I think, a, a, a liberal in a lot of ways or a progressive. Um, but she has two things going for her. One is that she's just very open minded. Uh, she's very smart. She's a deep thinker. Uh, she she uh, is very good at exploring all sides of an issue and she's honest. And the other is that she's just very good at, at knocking down so many of the, the pieties of the modern feminist movement. That's kind of respect specialist is is challenging uh, the the feminist assumptions of the day and in that she has earned you know no small amount of anger and ire from the left and and you know a lot of respect from the right uh, really no matter what your ideology somebody like Hoff Summers and and, and the other folks of the intellectual dark web um, they need to be commended if for nothing else than than you know testing the limits of 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 what is considered acceptable discourse um, and somebody like Hoff Summers and so many other folks are just so good at that well, and the idea that the campus left gets so overreactionary, hysterically angry uh, at people like Christina Hoff Summers, who in almost every other way mirror their values, tells you something. It does bespeak of a, of a quiet bias underneath what they proclaim to be freedom of expression. And so, as you said, Hoff Summers has come in for incredible, incredible criticism. What, what do you make of that argument? Uh, is it fair to say that the academic left, the more they demonize the alternative voices, really the more they are vindicating the idea that kids need to visit them in the first place. Yeah, I think that's true, and I and I think that more people are figuring that out. Um, you know, it's called the, uh, the the Barbara Streisand effect, I think, where uh, Barbara Streisand uh, was furious that. Um, that some paparazzi had taken a photograph of her house and demanded that it be retracted. Uh, but then, of course, it became the most popular photograph in the world at, at one point. Uh, and I think that, that that's what you're seeing, too, is that uh, more and more as these uh, you know intolerant mobs shut down these speakers, run them off campus, demonize them, you're going to see, I think, more people saying, well, maybe we should actually take a look at, at what these folks are saying and see if they're uh, the, the total demons that they're made out to be, or if they might have something actually interesting to say. And, and, and hopefully that's going to be on the rise in the coming years. Well, and if more kids go off campus to get fair and balanced information, bring it back to campus, inevitably that's going to cause, it's going to have to cause the schools to open up a little bit intellectually themselves. Be sure to stay up with all the latest news and information from the College Fix editors by joining us on all of our social media platforms. Daniel Payne, assistant editor at the College Fix. Thanks very much for your time today. When did we as Americans accept the idea that the purpose of college was one-sided ideological practice? The purpose of college has always, it's supposed to have been, critical thinking. Expose kids to a lot of different things and let them make up their own minds. They're not high school kids anymore. They're not elementary, middle school kids. These are 20-something-year-old kids who have the ability now to read and comprehend in ways that allows them to formulate their own worldview. What's happened on college campuses is, of course, exactly the opposite. Uh, We are giving kids a one-sided dialectic. Look, a kid's moral and political universe, a, a, a student's moral and political values should never devolve simply from the values, the progressive values 
values of their teachers or their universities. What we need is kids to come to their own moral perspectives by being exposed to lots of stuff. If the universities won't provide it, uh, won't provide it then the so-called intellectual dark web will. There are many places on uh, the internet where you can get really good, interesting, compelling arguments, even if ultimately you don't agree with them, that challenge the liberal status quo. As a teacher myself, the one comment I get that I take very seriously from my kids is when they say to me after a lecture or at the end of the semester, Dr. Pesta, how come no one's ever told me that before? That makes me happy. And much more so than, you're a great teacher. How come I've never heard this before? Presenting kids with different ideas, different alternatives, different ways of thought, that's what college should be about. And if kids can't find it on campus, find it somewhere else. And that's the final fix. I'm Dr. Duke, and we'll see you next time. For more videos and original articles, visit thecollegefix.com. And don't forget to like The College Fix on Facebook and follow on Twitter to receive your daily dose of right-minded news and commentary from across the nation.